This video is about my book project, History of the World, as seen from my family library. If you share an interest in family history, country house libraries, and history in general, then hopefully you'll find this interesting. Over the years, I have collected up a lot of information about my various ancestors, and I had often thought it would be great to write some sort of book about it. I was lucky to inherit a large number of family diaries, letters, portraits, and a wide range of ancestral relics. Every now and then, items have also turned up in auctions or from dealers, and these have added to my family archive. I've also had the pleasure of meeting numerous distant cousins and historians who have also given me further information. Central to the family archive was the family library that existed in the ancestral home of Linleywood in Staffordshire. The Lindleywood estate was bought by my great times four grandfather, James Caldwell, in 1791. Over the next 158 years, it had five owners, the last being my grandfather, who sold it in 1949, by which time the estate was very much run down. In fact, my grandfather's last note on the subject was, good riddance to a huge liability. Much of the contents, including most of the library, was sold by auction and dispersed. The main house was suffering badly from subsidence and was demolished 10 years later. I should point out that James Corwell was only one of my great times four grandfathers. Of course, we all have two parents, four grandparents, and if you do the maths, you'll figure out that we have 32 great times four grandfathers and also 32 great times four grandmothers, thus 64 great, 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 great grandparents. If you can trace your ancestors back to the 1600s, you will be looking at your great times 10 grandparents, and there were 4,096 of them, assuming none of them doubled up. As you may have guessed, I was not brought up in the UK. I was born in New Zealand, and I had very little contact with my British relatives. As it was, we did not have much money, and life was not easy. We lived in an ordinary house, and my mother did her best to bring us up on a tight budget, us being myself, my sister, and my brother. One thing that was different about our family was that we had a hyphenated surname, Heath Caldwell, while all our friends had normal names. During my childhood, I noticed that we had some things in our house that none of my friends had. One thing in particular was our cutlery. While all our friends had good quality stainless steel cutlery, our forks and spoons were all rather worn out. Over time, they'd start to go black. And so once a year, we would give them a good clean. A polish with a cloth would quickly make them shiny again. In my teenage years, I came to realise that this cutlery was all solid silver. Most of it had family crests on the handles, and on the back there were hallmarks confirming the year they were made. One particular spoon, this one here, was over 200 years old, and this got me fascinated. Where had all these items of cutlery come from? Presumably they were owned by some of our Heath Corwell ancestors. And these people, whoever they were, must have had a lot of money. Many questions came to mind. Who were these ancestors? Where had they lived? What had they done for a job? How had they made all their money? And in particular, what had happened to all their wealth? There certainly wasn't any money around when I was growing up. Also, why did we have a hyphenated surname? One item that I always remembered was a silver tray with the names James Caldwell engraved on it. And of course, this was the ancestor that I later discovered to be my great times four grandfather. Another ancestor that I did find out about was James Heath, who had been an engraver in the period 1780 to 1820. He engraved illustrations for books long before the advent of photographic methods. He was also one of my great times four grandfathers. In 1980, I came to the UK on a one year working holiday, and I met my father's sister, Aunt Pat. She lived in a very old cottage with a thatched roof. Inside was an amazing assortment of old furniture, portraits, china, silver, and a vast array of relics relating to the family, including hundreds of old books and a few diaries. Many of the portraits had inscriptions on the back, documenting in each case the name of the sitter and also including a list of his or her relatives. Many of the books also had previous owners' names neatly written inside the front cover or printed on a specially designed book plate. My aunt's house contained a massive amount of information, but all in bits 
In some ways it was a giant puzzle, with most of the bits still present. The challenge was to try and piece it all together and figure out the stories of all these different ancestors and how they all related to each other. One of the pictures on the wall was of the mansion house at Linley Wood. My aunt was able to tell me quite a lot about the old family estate, as she had lived there back in the 1930s. I took photographs and I started writing notes. Through the 90s, 80s and the 1990s, I steadily gathered information. I also visited antiquarian bookshops, where every now and then I would come across an old book with engravings by James Heath. In the 1990s, I made contact with a distant cousin, John Heath, who had carried out substantial research on our common ancestor, James Heath, and had recently published a book all about him. And I have a copy here. That's the one. By the late 1990s, with the advent of the internet, this opened up all sorts of new methods to search for information. And this was to be a giant leap forward in my quest for more details about my ancestors. I recognized that the internet was going to substantially change our lives. And so I needed to find out more about how it worked. The best way to achieve this was to build a website. And so I built a website that listed information about my many ancestors and their various relatives. This is www.jjhc.info. Now this started off initially just as a one page with a list of all the ancestors from top to bottom. And then one by one, I would put in one page on each ancestor, a biography. And I'd include photographs, diaries, um, letters, anything of general information. And it grew and grew and grew. In the end, it was about 20,000 pages. It's still there. The website itself is getting a bit old, but uh, do have a look if you get time. Now, the other thing that came with the internet was, as I was saying before, the ability to search for information. And one website which was very useful was one called abebooks.co.uk. And ABE Books was like a going into a secondhand bookshop, but there was something like 50 million books on the, on the shelf. And you could search by title, author, but also just general things. And this was fascinating because I had some ancestors who had written books. I'd always wanted to have copies to read, but um, I'd never come across them. And on ABE, there they were, not very many. Some were in the UK, some were in America. There was even the old one in Australia. So I started buying these books, and uh, brown packages were turning up uh, uh, every week. My wife was a little bit concerned that I might fill the whole house up with the books. But, but this was fascinating. And also, again, it got me interested in how the internet worked. Now, one of the early books that I bought actually had the book plate of an ancestor, Anne Marsh Corwell. So this was amazing. It was a book that was actually owned by my great times, three grandmother. And then a little while later, another one turned up with the book plate of James Stanford Corwell of Lindley Wood. So this is actually definitely from Lindley Wood. And I spoke to the book dealer and said, look, have you got any more of these? And he said, well, we might do. And um, he said, I'll come back to you. And a few months later, he contacted me to say, well, I found a couple of more books and here they are. And I thought, wow, that's fantastic. I'm, where did they come from? And he said, oh, I thought you might ask me that. And he said, well, I've spoken to my father and my father remembers going to the sale in 1949. It turned out that this book dealer, Robert Gibb, it was a three generation family shop. And his grandfather, also called Robert Gibb, had gone to the sale in 1949, taking his son, in other words, the middle one of the generation. And I managed to chat. The grandfather obviously was uh, long, long gone, but his father was still there and uh, he was able to tell me about the day. He remembered it quite well. Uh, so that was absolutely fascinating. So I, I had a chat with Robert Gibbs' father and he told me about uh, the auction where um, on the day the auction, he just went around the house and when they got to the library, he, w he just sold off the books shelf by shelf. There was only two people buying and they, they bought lots of books, filled their car up and drove off. Now, later on, around that time, there were lots of old homes being sold every weekend and they were buying books, tons of books, quite valuable books for peanuts. And they bought so many books that they buried books in their store. And hence his grandson, 50 years later, was still uncovering them. Over the next 10 years, uh, Robert actually uncovered about 100 volumes for me from their stock, which was, which was fantastic. So... That was, that was ABE. That was pretty good. Another thing on the internet was you could start accessing some of the National Archives. And in the National Archives and the County Archives, there was often information. The Staffordshire Record Office had quite a lot. So that was quite good. That was another trip. 
Other websites that came up, eBay, auction catalogs, they were very good. Various things came up, the odd book occasionally, but also a few family portraits, which was great. It was amazing what you could actually find. Now, all this was great. It was a hobby. It, it didn't sort of make me money. It lost me money, but I had lots of fun out of it. But a spin-off of all this hobby was actually Local Surveyors Direct, which is an internet company, which I started about 17 years ago. Local Surveyors Direct is a price comparison website for building surveyors, architects, um, and other people like that. So looking back, I'm really pleased that I had this family history hobby because it, it led off to other things, which has worked out quite well. The other thing with the family history website was that other people started contacting me. And one day the phone went, and it was an elderly lady by the name of Ursula Lockett. And she told me that she lived in number two Lindleywood Cottages, I think it was, something like that, but it was on the Lindleywood Estate. And she said that when the house was pulled down in 1960, her father was building a garden shed. And so he went up and, and took some of the doors from Lindleywood. And uh, Ursula told me that the garden shed had served them well for the last 50 years, but um, it was now falling down. And as a result, her husband, Mick, had finally demolished it. Um, and she said that and the remains of your doors are leaning against the apple tree if you'd like to come and collect them. So I went up and met them, lovely people. And sure enough, they had the remains of some of the old doors. So I recovered those. They're in my garage. One day I'm going to build a piece of furniture out of them or something like that. So yeah, as time went on, more, more people contacted me. Sometimes they were historians, sometimes they were distant cousins. There was one called David Holland who contacted me. Amazing guy. He'd been in World War II, where unfortunately he'd been uh, captured right at the beginning. He didn't manage to get off the beach at Dunkirk. Spent five years in jail, as he said, and then came back in 1945 when they were released. And um, he'd had a fascinating life. He'd ended up being Liberian in uh, Westminster. But he said that he remembered a list of the library books coming up for sale with a book dealer some years earlier and it had been bought by a Mr Whaley Cohen well that was the name that he remembered anyway so David said well you get, get the telephone directory out and phone up the Mr Whaley Cohen's in London there can't be very many of them so that was what I did well, that was back in the days when you had a telephone directory obviously that's all changed now but uh, anyway and I spoke to the first Mr Whaley Cohen and no he didn't collect library lists and I spoke to the second Mr Whaley Cohen and he didn't collect library lists and I spoke finally to the third Mr. Whaley Cohen, who was expecting my call because his brother had actually contacted him earlier. And he said, to, your, your relative, um, David Holland, is, is he elderly? And I said, well, yes, he's, he's in his 80s. And so Mr. Whaley Cohen said, well, I wonder if he's got the names mixed up because it's definitely not Mr. Whaley Cohen because there's three of us and you've spoken to all of them. Um, but he said, this might be a coincidence, but I've got a cousin called Charles Seabag Montefiore and he does collect library lists. So I thought, hmm, it's amazing. So he gave me Charles' phone number, and I was able to phone him up the following week, and, and he had the library list. It, it was just amazing. I went and visited him a, 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 about a month later, lovely family, and uh, he let me have the library list back, which was, which was fantastic. It was written out by my grandfather, actually, in about 1925, and later on I found some references to it in my grandfather's notes. He'd loaned it to the auctioneers, just prior to the sale and it was supposed to come back but it didn't it was uh, one of those things the library list anyway was fantastic it was a window into the world uh, as, as seen by my ancestors really it was their view of the world and it recorded about just over a thousand books so that, that was great so time went on and I continued to learn stuff but something unconnected with my family history we had a village quiz one day and we shared a table with um, one of our neighbours called Wally Wally Taylor Wally was a fascinating guy, and he was brilliant at answering questions, dates and everything else. He just knew them, and he seemed to know all the dates of the kings and queens. And I said, you know, how did you learn that? And he said, well, you know, in his day, they had to learn it at school. So that got me thinking about how, you know, how your brain works. And I thought, I wonder how long it takes to learn the, the dates of the kings and queens. So um, I wrote them out, put them onto a spreadsheet, and learned them. It only took about a week or so. And I thought that was quite fascinating. Having learned the main dates of the kings and queens, I then sort of added a few other dates, 1066 for William the Conqueror and invasion of England and the Battle of Hastings, 1666 when London burnt to the ground, and various other dates. I added in ancestors' dates. I added in some of the dates of books that I had. I added in dates of anything that really came of interest. And over time, this, this list of dates ended up being about 2,000 dates. And by then I'd figured out you couldn't learn them all. As fast as you were learning dates on one side of your brain, it would fall out of the other side of your brain. 
but it was a bit of fun. So things progressed. And then in the year 2020, of course, we had COVID and I'd been away and got back just as the lockdown started. And my wife assigned me to the attic on quarantine for a, a number of weeks. And she'd give me a yell every now and then and tell me my dinner was on the stairs. But uh, the rest of the time, I pretty much stayed up there. And it was during that time that I started writing a book, not about my ancestors, but I wrote a book um, really about my, my early days growing up in New Zealand, um, the ups and downs of Jeremy James, growing up in New Zealand in the 1960s and 1970s. I had a lot of fun with this and I self-published. One question was, should I go with a proper publisher or should I self-publish? And I thought, well, I'm never really going to be a famous author, so why not just self-publish? So I printed 100 copies, posted them to various friends, especially friends from um, the early days, and everybody really enjoyed it. So um, that was great. I also made a free PDF copy on the internet so anybody can get hold of it. So having produced one book, I then thought... I really would like to do a book to do with the family history. That was when I started my next book, which was History of the World. And uh, again, I've self-published um, and I've made a free PDF copy on the internet. I do have a look at it. It's on the website, jjhc.info. With the family history, I thought it would be nice to have a, a sort of a family history, but that sort of you know, just wouldn't be of interest to very many people except my cousins and so forth. I also wanted to do a history of the Lindleywood Library because that fascinated me and I had the library list, but of course it's mainly a list of books. So I got thinking about it and I realised that the library was sort of a window into the world and the list of dates, that hobby of learning dates that I'd had for a while, that in effect gave me a structure because with 2,000 dates all in chronological order, that gave me a structure of a history of the world, but in particular a history of the world with the events that were of interest to me and also uh, interlaced all the way through it was, was the books in the library. So that was how History of the World came about. And then, of course, I added in some of the big events that shaped the world, you know, various wars, various governments, all sorts of things like that. And also the development of the written word. That's quite a fascinating story in itself. So I interleaved all of these uh, right the way through it. I popped in little bits about various ancestors here and there, but also uh, lots of other people. Josiah Wedgwood was an associate of James Caldwell. In fact, he was he was James Caldwell was a protege of Josiah Wedgwood. That was uh, Josiah Wedgwood helped James Caldwell really to set his whole life up. So, if you get time, please do download a free PDF copy and have a look through. I hope you enjoy it. It's about five hundred pages, so it's quite a slog. There's also about three hundred uh, illustrations. So. Even if you just look through it, you should find it interesting. Uh, I did print 100 copies. If you prefer a hard copy, they're available at £25 per copy. But um, yeah, so that's, that's my little hobby. And that's, you can see that's what it's consisted of. And you can see where that, that's, that's where it's taken me. Um, I might retire from this hobby by now. But um, on the other hand, maybe there's a few more books in me yet. Thank you.